Today we're talking about the combined cases of Texas v. California and California v. Texas. Yeah, it's a real you can't sue me if I sue you first situation. So why are Texas and California fighting? Well, they're fighting about the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Gee, feels like something more than two states should be deciding. As a New Yorker, I'd like to at least be an asterisk in this decision name. So why aren't we wheeling out Solicitor General Noel Francisco or anyone from the federal government to defend this law? Well, simply put, it's because the federal government is standing firmly on the Texas side of the equation and booing any effort to defend the Affordable Care Act. Now, this has left a defendant void open that California has chosen to fill. So what's the problem today? Well, the Affordable Care Act is getting the Al Capone treatment. We can't take it down on merits or through congressional vote. Let's investigate its tax status. If the Affordable Care Act were a video game boss, the individual mandate would be the unsubtly glowing red area you're supposed to shoot at to take the rest of it down. It says that you can either buy health insurance or pay a penalty. Now, in a previous episode, link at the end, I went into detail about how the Supreme Court in 2012 ruled that the individual mandate was constitutional because it was a tax. The basic logic was weighing two competing arguments, whether the individual mandate was, well, a mandate compelling people to buy health insurance and therefore not a tax and not constitutional. Or was it just a reverse sales tax, in which case it is A-OK. -okay. In the end, it was found that eh, it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck. So it doesn't matter what it's called, it's a duck. Basically, sure the term mandate isn't great branding, but it's small enough to not eliminate the uninsured option for consumers and is a revenue collected by the IRS. So what changed between then and now? Well, during the infamous Trump tax cuts, Trump cut this individual mandate tax down to zero. Today the individual mandate still certainly looks like a duck, but it stopped quacking. Quick Kavanaugh, huck one of your empties at it, see if it's still alive. So how does that change the conversation? I mean, a nerfed individual mandate sounds like a huge win for conservatives. Buy health insurance or else. I'm going to count down to three. You're still not doing it? No, I'm not mad, just disappointed. The argument now is that the individual mandate lacks the essential feature of any tax. It doesn't raise any money, no one pays the treasury department anything, and the IRS doesn't enforce it. Yeah, we're entering the accounting equivalent of if a tree falls and no one is around to hear it. If a tax exists but doesn't raise money, is it still a tax? Oh man, that's deep. Who knew accounting could get so philosophical? So why is a tax of zero not a tax? According to the federal government's brief, no matter Congress's goals, a statute is only valid under the tax clause if it is productive of some revenue for the government. The source for this definition isn't Donald Trump's posterior, but rather the 1937 case of Sonzinski v. United States. Ooh, analysis of a Great Depression tax case, exactly what you were hoping for when you clicked on this video. In that case, a gun shop owner refused to pay an annual $200 tax because he thought it was unconstitutional. The courts looked at the tax and said, the annual tax imposed under the National Firearm Act does produce some revenue and is thus a permissible use of Congress's general taxing power. Courts should not speculate as to congressional motives in imposing a law or the extent to which it imposes restrictions, as long as it serves as a revenue producing purpose. So as long as the United States government is profiting off of the uninsured in this country, the individual mandate stands. The big difference between today's case and this case from 1937 is what is being asked. In that case, it was ruled that something that is a productive form of revenue is definitely a tax. Well, you could argue that that certainly implies something not producing revenue isn't a tax. Someone needs to say that quiet part out loud. This could be, as progressives hope, a case of all squares being rectangles, 
but not all rectangles being squares. All revenue producing measures are taxes, but not all taxes are revenue producing measures. Of course, this leads to the obvious follow up question. If this is no longer a reverse sales tax because it isn't raising revenue anymore, what is it? The answer, according to Texas, is well, it's an empty mandate for the American people to buy health insurance. If it doesn't raise money, it is just a command to buy health insurance. Which, put another way, is a command to participate in commerce, which the Supreme Court has said is unconstitutional. Now, on the other hand, progressives explain the exact same reality with a slightly less ominous voice. They argue two things. First, really? This is still definitely a tax. You set it to zero in a、uh, tax cut. And it sits on the books as a tax whose value can be changed at any time. The 2012 Supreme Court case recognized the individual mandate as offering a lawful choice between buying insurance and paying a tax. And the only change Congress made to the individual mandate was to reduce the amount of the alternative tax to zero. Now, if you're not quite sold yet, progressives have another argument up their sleeves for why an individual mandate that isn't a tax shouldn't be considered unconstitutional. With the penalty at zero, there is now no penalty to remaining uninsured. So, how could it be construed as a mandate? As the filing puts it, it boggles the mind to suggest that Congress intended to turn a non mandatory provision into a mandatory and unconstitutional provision by doing away with the only means of incentivizing compliance with that provision. Yeah, this is now the equivalent of the government saying, hey, get out there and vote. And we all know how effective that call to action is. Sign up for health insurance, or we'll do nothing about it. Of course, the fact that the individual mandate might be found to be unconstitutional won't automatically sink the Affordable Care Act ship. The question then becomes does removing the individual mandate remove the heart of the Affordable Care Act, or more the appendix? Eh, you can cut that easily. We're not even sure why it was put in there in the first place. The answer here doesn't rest on the effectiveness of the legislation, but rather on congressional intent. To understand this debate, it's simpler to start with the conservative arguments. They view the individual mandate as a Jenga brick that you would have to be crazy to tamper with. The reason is the Affordable Care Act was a delicate balance of costs and benefits. Take, for example, protecting pre existing conditions. That's not great for insurers. But we'll balance that out by taxing a bunch of healthy people into buying insurance. Removing the mandate alone would upset the balance of costs and benefits that the rest of the major provisions seek to achieve. Because removing the individual mandate tips the scales firmly against insurance companies, it transforms the entirety of the Affordable Care Act into something that Congress might not have passed. Taking a stand against insurance companies? Ooh, let's not bite the hand that feeds us, guys. This would even extend to completely unrelated issues like the Medicaid expansion, because the minor provisions would then also have to be invalidated, because there's no reason to believe that Congress would have passed them without the rest of the Affordable Care Act. Now, to put this argument into perspective, if Congress passed a hypothetical Take Away Guns, Trucks, and Everything Else Country Songs Are About Act of 2021, well, that's probably not going to get very far in court because it violates most of the Constitution. Let's just say that act has an unrelated statute in which it says, and we're going to pay for it by raising taxes on alcohol. When the majority of that act gets struck down, you're left with just an alcohol tax. Clearly not the goal of Congress. The whole could be nullified by the courts. In response to this, progressives parry back with,、uh, How can you say that this is something Congress wouldn't do when it's exactly what Congress did? They passed the Affordable Care Act, and then later they dropped the individual mandate to zero. Nobody whoopsie daisied their way into this outcome. <clears throat> Your Honor, sure, I bought a grenade and then years later decided to remove the pin part, 
but I wasn't anticipating any explosions. I just thought the grenade would be better without it. Similarly, Congress had several opportunities to throw out all or parts of the Affordable Care Act, but all of those votes failed. Lastly, progressives point to reality. More specifically, the fact that since the beginning of 2019, when the elimination of the penalty went into effect, the market for individual health insurance has remained stable. So, its removal hasn't led to a massive exodus of people who really didn't want health insurance, but bought it to avoid a small penalty for non-participation. This means that, as far as cost-benefit analyses are concerned, despite the individual mandate being zeroed out, nothing really seems to have changed. The Affordable Care Act still seems to be functioning as originally intended. So those are the arguments going on between Texas and California in the Supreme Court today. Of course, the simplest remedy to this entire thing is to just have Congress raise the individual mandates penalty to one penny between now and when the Supreme Court's decision gets released in spring. That would render this entire debate and the decision moot. Until next time, I'll see you in court. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! First I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the courts, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. For more videos covering the courts, click right over here. Remember to subscribe and ring that bell so the freedom will continue to ring and give me a like if you liked what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.